Um, we are uh, focusing on projects in off grid and we've got a great example uh, from Noida uh, to take us through this process. Uh, I am Chris Morris. I head up the team at Local Energy Scotland to deliver the Scottish Government's Community and Renewable Energy Scheme. Um, and I'm just going to share a presentation very briefly uh, to get us started and then we will <laughs> kick off into the main session. So hopefully everybody can see that. Not yet. Oh, okay. Thank you. Bear with me. Perfect. There we go. Yeah, that's it now. Perfect. Thank you. Um, so this is the off grid places in remote islands, and we'll hear from uh, Frank Catherley from Noidart Renewables. Uh, Kyle Smith from Energy Mutual, who is the project manager through this and has helped them throughout, and uh, Ralph from Natural Power, who did some of the technical diligence. So we'll open it into a, a bit of a wider discussion uh, after we've heard the kind of initial presentations and remarks. Um, just very briefly, we uh, on the Community and Renewable Energy Scheme, CARES, uh, our goal is that communities across Scotland are engaging, participating and benefiting in the energy transition to net zero. Mm. And CARES supports community involvement in kind of four key areas uh, for shared ownership projects, in local energy systems, uh, to maximise the impact from community benefits and to contribute to Scotland's uh, two gigawatt target by 2030. That's a target around the amount of community and locally owned energy by 2030. So uh, they're the kind of key priorities for us. We've also been doing some work with uh, remote grid uh, projects, uh, working with Highlands and Islands Enterprise on this, and we're keen to do more of it. And the project we're talking about today is one of the projects that was supported through that project program. Uh, we are able to support uh, remote grids to do some kind of proprietary work at the moment in terms of getting ready for projects and we hope to have a call for capital funding next financial year later uh, in this year um, but these projects take a long time to get going so we're very keen to work with uh, remote grid projects now so we can start getting them in the in the right shape um, uh, to put applications in in later in the year. Just in terms of Local Energy Scotland, we deliver the Scottish Government's Community and Renewable Energy Scheme. Uh, we have a, it's not just a funding programme, we have our team who are development officers, we have specialist support advisors, and we also have our fund administration team who make sure kind of payments get to you on time uh, and grants and et cetera are processed. We also have a lot of resources. We try and learn from projects we do by adding resources into our toolkit. We have frameworks of suppliers, lots and lots of case studies and good practice principles that support industry. And finally, we provide grants, loans and access to, to technical advice. So uh, thank you for letting me do that. I'll stop sharing my screen now. Uh, I'll stop sharing my screen now and really just open up for the rest of the session. Now we've uh, just set a little bit of context. So, um, Frank, I think you're going to start us off and tell us a little bit about the journey Noidart Renewables have uh, been through on, on, on developing your project today and some of the lessons you've learned. Okay, no. um, my name is Frank Atherley and I've uh, been introduced already by uh, Chris. Um, I'm leaving Chris on tenterhooks because he asked me with a slight twitch whether or not I've turned off the uh, chime in my clock that reverberates uh, through meetings. I guess you're just going to have to find that out uh, at, at two o'clock, really. Um, I thought I'd kick off in a relatively incoherent and largely unscripted way by saying a little bit about uh, where and what Noidart is. And then I'll say a little bit about electricity on Noidart. It'll sound historic, but there's some context that's uh, that needed and uh, Kyle will take on the nitty gritty of the energy security project and then uh, uh, we'll you know we'll get it Ralph will say a little bit more about it as, as well. Uh, a lot of you will know uh, about Noida but I think for those of you that don't uh, Noida is a peninsula uh, to the north of Malig uh, that juts out towards Ord Sky. Uh, you've got uh, two ways of uh, getting to Noida. Uh, you can either take two, day, two days to walk in uh, from one of uh, two directions, Glenfiddan or alternatively for the north, or you can take a not entirely cheap uh, Highland Council subsidised ferry uh, to get here. 
there are logistical problems associated with being on Neurat. And uh, one of the parallel discussions that I'm having at the moment, the Scottish Government relates to rogue equivalence uh, tariff and the extra costs that are associated with that, both for people living here, uh, but also when you intend to embark upon a major project such as the one that uh, Kyle will, will illustrate. Um, there were once 2,000 people living on Neurat before the hiring clearances, uh, but a series of poor landlords, the creation of sheep runs, and so on and so forth drove us down to having approximately uh, 40 uh, residents um, uh, going into the uh, 1970s. Um, and the degree to which Noid Art was a viable community, you know, had a large question mark over it. Uh, now we uh, rich in tourist resources and uh, we do a lot of forestry. But I suppose the jewel in the crown, in a sense, is the fact that we can theoretically provide 280 kilowatts of electricity to people. And uh, that's entirely clean, green electricity because we're also entirely off grid. So we're not connected to the national grid. And if you want electricity on Neudart, and there are about 120 people living on Neudart at the moment uh, with the businesses that are associated with that, you basically have to get it from Neudart Renewables unless you want to uh, burn diesel or fuel oil. Uh, that is an unsustainable thing in the long run. And actually currently uh, our price of 20 pence a unit for electricity compares rather favourably uh, with much of the mainland, though there are some issues relating to, uh, to that, which we'll be exploring not today, but uh, as, a, as a board at some point in the future. I said I'd mention electricity on Noida. Um, at the uh, to start off with, at the end of the last ice age, we basically had a huge contribution made to electricity on uh, Noidar, which was a periglacial feature. And that's Loch Bromisake, a thousand foot up on the side of uh, Ben Bui, which gives us a storage capacity of about 76 megawatt hours of uh, electricity. If only we can tap it. It's like a giant aquatic battery just up there. Um, but just coming away from that briefly, uh, in the 1950s, up to the 1950s, Northern Art had no electricity. And if you wanted to heat your home, you did it uh, by burning peat uh, or you uh, imported coal um, or some, uh, I don't know if there was fuel oil at the time. But then in, at some point in the 1950s, one of the good uh, landlords called Major MacDonald decided he was going to put in a diesel generator. And every household got a connection around Inverie Bay, which gave an electric light bulb and three pin plug, and it was on for about three hours a day. There was a very eulogistic article written in one of the local papers at, at that, that time. Moving forward rapidly, in the 1970s, Major MacDonald, the landlord, decided that he was going to take advantage of Lot Bromisay with all its capacity and put a pipeline in. A thousand foot down a very, very steep incline, um, uh, held on large concrete blocks um, that would go to a turbine and generator house uh, that was uh, put together by Jilks. Uh, and that then provided electricity on Neudart. Um, unfortunately, uh, it was a very iffy supply. And as the various poor landlords uh, decided not to maintain it because they didn't have the money to do it, we started to slide for a theoretical capacity of a couple of hundred kilowatts of electricity uh, to 40 or 50 intermittently with lots of outages for a few hours a day. Um, Neudart was, the Neudart estate was part bought by the uh, Neudart Foundation, what we uh, call the uh, buyout. Not the whole estate, but half of the estate and started to invest uh, in the uh, Neudart's, in Neudart infrastructure, which basically meant investing uh, in the hydro scheme, which was actually pivotal for the uh, maintenance of well of, of, of life on, on Neudart. And Neudart Renewables was uh, created for that purpose in uh, 1999. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the half of the estate that has the uh, dam on it and the uh, uh, reservoir on it, uh, plus the uh, pipeline, plus the generator and turbine house, and Neudart Renewables owns bits of it or has abstraction rights on bits of it, um, uh, belong to the Kilhoan estate who uh, we have good relations with, but it isn't perfect to uh, have all one's infrastructure on somebody else's, on somebody else's land. 
Um, we spent about £1.2 million pounds, uh, from the purchase of uh, the estate through to 2015. Uh, with a big refurbishment of the dam, which was uh, losing water at a rate of knots down the hillside, uh, where we uh, refaced the dam and did some other work uh, that Carl would be much more knowledgeable on, because he worked on that project, uh, as did uh, Ed Carrick, a civil engineer that got thoroughly uh, involved in the project. And we then decided we needed to turn our minds towards the pipeline. And whilst thinking about that, the pipeline sent us a message. And this message was one of the concrete blocks shifting and a water feature uh, extending a thousand foot into the air, which could be seen from the pier. And of course, all the electricity ceased at that point, uh, telling us that we better not just think about it, we'd possibly better do something about it as well. Uh, we uh, uh, tried as best we could to do uh, camera surveys, but uh, the problem, of course, is that uh, it's against uh, iron nodules. Um, we uh, started clamping uh, as if uh, clamps were going out of fashion to try and keep the water in the pipeline uh, to deal with pinhole leaks. Uh, at the moment, we have 14. Well, we haven't now because there's no water in the pipeline. Well, that's something that Kyle will touch on. Uh, we fitted 14 clamps to deal with the pinhole leaks. Basically, uh, we've, uh, we then had a civil engineering report uh, from Ed Carrick, who I mentioned, and, and the uh, message was, you best do something with the pipeline very, very soon because it won't last more than three or four years. Um, that was a, a significant uh, message because we supply about 100 customers around Inverie Bay. We've got uh, seven uh, kilometres of power lines, 11 kilovolt, three phase power lines. We've got 85 poles, 14 transformers, and these customers are entirely dependent on us. And we risk being completely without electricity when we have that Houston, we have a problem uh, moment. Um, Fortunately, uh, we have people we've worked with, uh, a character civil engineer, uh, Kyle had worked with us, uh, and we also engaged Community in Scotland to come up with a series of options for us. Uh, they looked through possibilities like the egg solution, a mixed economy of um, photovoltaic cells and um, wind turbines and, uh, and hydro. Um, Possibly, uh, and there are those in the community that thought this would be the answer, a subsea cable so we could join onto the national grid um, and various other options as well. Trouble with all of these is they turned out to be very expensive. Uh, the subsea cable uh, came in at, I think it was £11 uh, million, pounds, and that was out without dealing with things at either end or doing a subsea survey, which was uh, eye-watering. Um, and SSE didn't want to do it anyway not entirely surprisingly, and the mixed economy would require, would one be more expensive than the other the option that we decided to go to uh, in the end, uh, which was the pipeline replacement, um, and require constant refurbishment over the course of the years. So after a lot of community uh, consultation, um, meetings in the hall, um, explaining the various options, the various possibilities, uh, you know, a couple of public, public meetings, uh, we decided that Angela Williams, um, who some of you uh, will know, uh, at the behest of the board, would engage into a feasibility study with a view to replacing the pipeline, or as I regularly said, uh, an energy security project to sort out the whole kit and caboodle, because we wouldn't want a brand new pipeline and everything else falling over, which to a certain extent looks, uh, uh, looks uh, possible. Um, we worked uh, with via Angela Williams. Uh, Carl was at this moment out of the frame doing other exciting stuff like rowing across the Atlantic. Um, uh, worked very closely with High, with Ian Philbert High, and very closely uh, with Rab Lees, who's uh, in this meeting at, uh, at Local Energy Scotland. Uh, and we found that very, very helpful in sort of forming what we intended to do and how we intended to do it and how we could build a project team uh, to take what we call phase three, which is the actual design build and the process of uh, the energy security project that Kyle will touch on uh, in just in just a moment. We got the uh, band back together again. Uh, we got Kyle on board uh, through Energy Mutual. Uh, we got Ed Carrick has been invaluable on board, um, you know, civil engineer that's done work uh, for us. And we created a, a project team. 
In parallel to that, though, I think it felt we, we felt it was important to have some political oomph behind it. So I met with um, uh, sundry Scottish government ministers uh, to bend their ear on perhaps the uh, how politically inconceivable it would be for Noidart to turn into the St Kilda of the 21st century off the coast of Malague with people wandering aimlessly around uh, a you know, depopulated landscape. But that gave me an entree into the civil servants that got behind the project um, and then we're able to uh, sort of activate the support from local energy Scotland we needed that would also allow us to put together the funding package that we needed uh, to put together. Um, it was quite important that we did that, that we tied it in with the issues relating to the whole of the microgrid, because these are not issues and problems just for Noidart. These are issues and problems for Ram, Egg, Muck and various other islands, Fula and so on and so forth. It's the whole question of Scottish government's investments and the way in which that might occur. And we worked uh, in concert with uh, the microgrid and uh, High and Melly McRae were able to broker a lot of that, for which we're properly and appropriately grateful. Uh, Kyle and I uh, also went and bent the ear of people at the Energy Network Association and had conversations with government civil servants as we gradually started to form what this project would actually look like. Now, in a moment, Carl's going to say something uh, of what's going to take us uh, through uh, the project itself. I've given you these sort of early parts of it. Um, when Carl's done, I will want to say a little bit, depending on what he says, about the uh, level of support we got from Local Energy Scotland and the importance of due diligence and how much we valued the due diligence. Um, someone did say to me, it must be terrible for you, Frank, having to jump all through all those hoops. And the answer is no, those aren't hoops to jump through. They're a necessary part of the project and we've actually gained a lot from it. Uh, it's fair to say the natural power, uh, you know, have been invaluable with it, has have Arup who were brought in to do the financial due diligence. And I have to say, as have been Harper McLeod, who did the legal due diligence with it. Without these people, we wouldn't have been able to do it. And again, I say we are properly and appropriately uh, grateful. Uh, it's fair to say that we've done a lot of this for ourselves and uh, Chris can come to a conclusion as to what input uh, Lord Art Renewables has put in and how much is coming from elsewhere. I think we um, have enough uh, skills and ability that we could, uh, could mobilise uh, to probably create a project in due course uh, that people could get behind because I think we put a good project uh, together. So I think we did it for, us, for ourselves in many ways, but not without the sort of help that I've touched on and that uh, Kyle will expand on. I will, of course, be able to answer any questions that anybody's got later. Is that okay? That's great. Thanks. <clears throat> Thanks for that, Frank. A, a, a great context. And over to you now, Kyle. Yeah, well, good, good afternoon, everyone. Um, yeah, I think my, my plan is to, to build on um, a little bit of what Frank has uh, kind of introduced. Now it's kind of going into the details of actually the delivery of the project itself. Um, I've got a few slides here that have some pictures on them just to give a bit of context of, of the project. And I don't know if, uh, if Barry, have you, have you had any luck trying to share the screen or? Hey, just like that, excellent. Yeah. Perfect. Well, feel free, Barry, just to, to to click through the first couple of slides there. And I think um, Frank's given a you know, nice overview of the project. And I think the first first slide just gives a, a map of where Noida actually is. Um, so if you go to that first slide, of uh, there we go. Yeah. So that's that's roughly where Noida is. We've got Inverie Bay, and Frank's given an overview there of how Noida Renewables was set up in two thousand and one to look after the electrical assets that the community purchased as part of their community land buyout. The, the actual hydropower system was installed in the late 1970s. And as you can imagine, by the time it came around to 2001, there was several improvements that had to take place. And so over the past 20 years under community ownership, the, the, the quality of the, the power supply has gradually improved little by little to the point now that people expect 24-7 expect power. But 20 years ago, that, that wasn't the case. You know, people were familiar with blackouts on a daily basis. And really this energy security project was ensuring that we continue to provide 24 seven power you know, for another generation and really ensure that we have enough power capacity to allow the community to continue to grow. And there's been several businesses that have established over the past few years and new businesses that, that want to establish themselves in Noidart and, uh, and new people that want to, want to move into the community. So it's really a, a critical infrastructure for this, uh, this small community to, to continue to, to grow and thrive. 
So if we go to the next slide there, Valerie. Yeah. This is a, an, just an overview of the electrical network in, in NoidArt. So just give a, a bit of context of the way it's uh, laid out. So on the right-hand side of the screen, we've got the hydropower system and a couple of, you know, a straight blue line, which demonstrates the existing pipeline, which basically went directly down the hillside over a very steep and uh, rocky outcrop. And then a new pipeline that takes a bit more of a circuitous route down from the dam to the hydropower system, but it's on a much gentler gradient and actually allows an access track up to the dam. So all the repair work up until now on the dam and on the system was done by foot and by helicopter. So very you know, challenging from a logistical perspective and also very expensive. So now, now we've future-proofed it in terms of access to the dam. And then the lines going off to the left here around the bay show the overhead 11 kV network. And in some ways it's quite unusual for a community to own an overhead high voltage network. And with that comes several responsibilities to look after that network from a technical perspective and also from a safety perspective. And so we, over time, we've been looking at you know, refurbishing parts of the network and uh, you know, maintaining the transformer. So each of these numbers on, on, the, on the screen correspond to distribution transformer that steps down the high voltage to lower voltage uh, for distribution to, to the properties. And in many ways, it's quite unusual that a community actually owns generation, distribution, metering, and billing. So the overall energy system, which on the mainland is fragmented to di into different sectors where each sector is, is uh, you know, can't talk to one another. So you have the generation side of things, the transmission, distribution, the billing and metering all separated. But here the community owns, owns all of the assets and manages all of the assets. So we go to the next, next slide here, Larry. And this is just to give an overview of what the refurbishment was back in 2001. So this was the, the original dam. As you can see, there's a few leaks. Um, it, there's, you know, it was built on kind of a, a few rocks and just a bit of concrete. And back in 2001, this was improved to a certain extent to, to actually keep the water in. Um, and they replaced parts of the, the old pipeline, but um, the, there wasn't enough design oversight at the time. And uh, the contractor went bankrupt partly, part of the way through it. And the, the project wasn't really refurbished to the level that it should have been back in 2001. And the community has been living with several of these, several issues since, since then. So since 2015, we've been gradually improving the, the, the overall system. And uh, this most recent energy security project has been the, you know, a significant investment in, in, in the energy system. So if we go to the next slide, we, we've got the, the improvements that took place in 2015. So this is the, the new dam that was installed and that basically secures the, the storage system that Frank was talking about and make sure there's, there's no leaks through the dam. And we also put two large pipes through the dam as well. So increasing the capacity of flow through the dam and then down the hillside. But at the time in 2015, we, we thought that the, the existing pipeline would last a bit longer. Um, and we didn't have enough funds at the time to actually replace the whole pipeline, even though we knew there was a few issues with it in terms of the, the steel degradation and the concrete block degradation. And then two years after this, if we go to the next slide, we, we have the, the water feature that Frank was talking about there. And this was really a, a pivotal moment when the lights went out and an anchor block cracked. And it required a community effort to actually get the pipeline realigned, reconnected, and, and, and up and running again. And credit to the, the guys on the ground, they did a, did a great job in getting up and running very quickly. And to, to Ed Carrick for specifying the concrete anchor blocks and getting the system up and running again. But it was an expensive repair. And it was at this point, as Frank said, that the energy security project came about. And, and this is when we had to start considering new pipeline options and different routes. So if we go to the next slide, we'll be looking at the, the, the layout, the different options that were considered as part of this um, energy security project. As we go through these slides, we've broken the, the energy security project into three work packages. Work package one is the actual new pipeline installation. And then work package two is a refurbishment of the old mechanical and electrical components of the hydro turbine. And work package three is some essential electrical <laughs> distribution system improvements. So if we look at a work package one, we, we really didn't know what direction this new pipeline would go in. So the, the map on the bottom left here shows several different options that were considered. And we worked very closely with, with Green Highland Renewables, who were appointed in, in the first phase of the energy security project. So if, if we backtrack a little bit, the, the, the security project was broken down into three phases. The first phase was, was development, so actually trying to identify the best route for the pipeline. And then the second phase was detailed design of that pipeline and, and tendering for a, a civil engineering contractor and raising the funds. And then the third phase was the actual implementation work in the construction of, of, of each of these work packages. So we're currently in the construction phase and, and you know, a long ways through that construction phase, coming close to the end of it. 
So we've, with this first phase, we're looking at different options. And I think that was, it was a really important phase to go through and many different options were considered um, in terms of the different pipe routes. And eventually we, we settled on this, this light gray line, which shows a number of switchbacks. So the pipeline and track follow each other quite closely down the hillside. And as you can see from the pictures on the right, it's quite a steep, rugged terrain. So very, very difficult to pick out an appropriate route up, up this hillside. But, but credit to, to Green Highland Renewables for the work they did. They, they spent a long time roaming the hillside to try and find the right gradient that would work for the pipeline and the contractor and also work for a long-term access track. So that's, a, that's an overview of the, the work package one, design and development work that, that took place. In the bottom um, right-hand corner here, we have a, an illustrated representation of the native woodland scheme that will be planted as part of this project. So in some ways we're fortunate that the adjoining landowner was planning a woodland, native woodland scheme at the same time. And we asked him to hold that for a couple of years until we did the pipeline project, put the, put the access track in place. And the planting is actually gonna start in, in January, February time. And as part of our scope, we, we put a new fence line around the project. So over the, over the next few years, we'll see this native woodland start to regenerate and we'll cover up, the pipeline will be buried and we'll cover up the access track. So this is the, the artistic representation of what it will look like in five to 10 years time. So if we go to the next slide, this is an overview of the, the work package two, which actually, no, sorry, it's not. <laughs> this actually is an overview of, of the actual lock itself and the access track. So I don't know if you can make it out on your screen here, but just to the left of that conifer block is where the powerhouse is located um, next to the Inverie River. And then the access track winds itself up this, uh, this hillside onto the plateau and you can see Loch Broomsake, which feeds the, the, the pipeline and the hydropower system. So it's a really nice location for a hydropower system in that it's got a, a large loch that's 300 meters above the turbine house. So it doesn't actually take that much flow out of the loch to, to, to create 300 kilowatts of power. And then the pipeline that we installed now is actually oversized for the current demand, but it gives the flexibility in the next 40 years for the community to upsize the turbine if required or to add an extra turbine in parallel if the demand from the community uh, you know, goes above 300 kilowatts in the next 20 to 40 years. And that was one of the challenges with this project in that because it's not grid connected and because we're trying to plan for future demand, you, you're trying to build in design options in the future that allow for, for expansion of, of, of the system and not just con constraining ourselves to the current requirements. Whereas if this was, a, this was a grid connected system, you'd be looking at optimizing every element of the project to maximize output and minimize costs for, for, that, uh, for that grid connected project. But in this case, we had a few other design variables that had to be considered in terms of uh, future expansion opportunities. So the next slide is just a, a quick overview of the actual turbine itself. So it's, uh, it, was, it was installed in the late 1970s and has a, an old 1960s Woodward mechanical governor, which most of the time works extremely well. The, the challenge we have is if, is if, if this was to fail, um, it's quite difficult to get it repaired and there's, there's not that many spare parts for it. So in, in discussions with Jilks, we've come up with a modernization work package, which will be replacing this, uh, this control system and governor with a modern digital system, which will allow remote access, uh, automatic restarts and, and fault finding on, on the turbine, as well as in the future, potentially synchronizing the hydro turbine with the backup generator and other renewables that might be required in the future. So it's really about modernizing the system and getting it ready for the next 40 years or more of, of, of operation. So this hydro ME, these, these hydro m &E works will start to take place in spring of next year. So we're focused on getting the pipeline installed now and, uh, and then we'll be moving on to the m &E works uh, next year. And then the next slide uh, gives an overview of some of the electrical works that are taking place. So we, we have an overhead line that connects the the, the turbine all the way into the community. And at the moment we get you know, a number of bird strikes on this throughout the year and, and probably the most faults on the, on the network occur on this section of, of overhead line. So we're working on, on a longer term uh, solution for that and potentially undergrounding it. But the main electrical works that'll take place next year will be occurring in the village at this uh, 11 kV um, substation. So this is where the 11 kV overhead line comes into the backup generator and there's a village substation here that then distributes the power to all the properties in, in the local village there. And we'll be looking at upgrading each of the switches so that we can switch in and out different, different sections of the network for fault finding and uh, uh, also make it easier to, to, to integrate the backup generator when there is um, faults or, or problems on the network. So I think that's an overview of, the, of the, the three main work packages. I think if we go to the next slide, 
provide, it's just to give a, an overview of the actual project management structure. And although it's, it's Frank and I you know, talking or giving this presentation today, there's a whole, whole team behind us that, that's supporting us with this. And so we've got the day-to-day the, the -day Nordic Renewables Operations team, which is you know, Craig Dunn as the operations manager for the foundation. Jim Brown, who's the on-site maintenance manager, who's looked after the hydro system for the past 20 years and has an, an intimate knowledge with it. And then we've got Louise, who does the, the, the finance management for the foundation. And then the, the actual Nordic Renewables project team is, is myself and Frank, who, who uh, are on the, we're on the phone together mo most days to, to, to update each other on how things are progressing. And then Ed, Ed Carrick, who's been a civil engineer and supporting the foundation for almost 20 years as well. And Jim Wilson, who's a retired electrical engineer for SSE, but he actually installed the, the overhead 11 kV network 35 years ago when he was working for SSE. So he has a lot of background knowledge of, of the system. And then our solicitors who, who, who've supported us through the development stage, um, Anderson MacArthur. So there's, been, there's a big team behind us that have been supporting us. And then each of the work packages, we, we've got contracted partners to, to deliver on each of those packages. And then we've got our wider stakeholder team, which includes the local, local Energy Scotland team as our main project funders. And then also SSE Community Fund is a more minor funder for the, for the, the turbine upgrade work and just the wider community in general. So it's, it's a big project team and it's, it's, you know, it's a lot of people to keep, keep up to date with, with the project, but there's also a lot of support behind this as well um, to, to get us to where we are today. And I think that the final slide is kind of starting to go into the questions that Frank was gonna raise around the, some of the lessons learned. So maybe I, I just give a quick overview of these lessons learned and then um, we can go into the details of them or let, let, um, let, let Frank and, uh, and Ralph comment on it as well. But um, I think Frank, Frank touched on it around the, the planning aspect and that it does take quite a bit of time to get, get through planning. I think we were in a fortunate position in some ways that we had a failing asset and a critical piece of infrastructure that had to get replaced very quickly. So um, planning went through, relative, the de development planning went through relatively quickly. One of the key parts of it was actually engaging with our local planning officer and getting them out to site and getting Nature Scotland on site during the development phase and explaining to them what we wanted to do and getting their feedback and concerns early on before we actually submitted the planning application. And then when it actually came to the design and tendering process, um, we, I discussed we, we really wanted to plan for the future. So it was really thinking through what the future opportunities might look like. And then also working with contractors that have experience in these remote environments. And some of them are quite small contractors and that aren't familiar with the public contract Scotland process. And in some ways we, we have to give them a bit of support and encouragement to go through, um, go through PCS and put their tender in. Um, so if you've got a good contractor out there, don't let them get put off by PCS and find a way to work with them to make sure they submit a good bid and reassure them that the, the valuation, tender valuation process is not just on price, but it's on quality and showing that, that past experience. And it just gives them a bit more reassurance as, as they go through it. Um, and then the, the fundraising and budgeting aspect is just trying to make sure that you've got all your costs covered and there's always eventualities that come up that, that you, you couldn't consider at the, the planning stage and making sure there's enough contingency built in there for certain aspects. Um, and then the, the due diligence aspect that, that Ralph will touch on is being you know, an invaluable part of this overall project. And it's partly due to, to why it's, it's gone relatively smoothly so far this year. And I, I touch wood for not done yet, but um, it's really tightened up our contracts that we've had with our civil engineering contractor, with the design team, the legal agreement that we had with, with the adjoining landowner. And it's just been a second fresh pair of eyes looking through our documentation. And in some ways, giving us a bit of leverage to go back to our partners and say, look, this, this contract isn't as tight as, tight as we need it. Um, we need to get it through our due diligence team. Can you, can you work with us on this? So that's given us a bit of leverage to go back to them. And then when it comes to the actual construction installation process, it's really just comes down to communication and making sure that the board are aware of what's happening, the community is aware of what's happening, and all of our project partners are, are up to date and comfortable with, 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 with how things are progressing. And by, by having a, a weekly catch up with Local Energy Scotland, it's, 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 it's made me keep, keep track of what's happening on a week-to-week -week basis and keep on top of the claims. And it's just been a very easy process to, to work through with, with the Local Energy Scotland team. So I think from, from my perspective and Audit Renewables perspective, we've been really happy with the support that we've received. So that's, that's it for me. Um, I'll, I'll pass back to, to Chris and, and Ralph and Frank for any other comments. Thanks, Carl. That's really great. And um, before we open up, Ralph, do you want to, is there a couple of things just building on the due diligence uh, uh, comments there you, you want to talk through? Sure, just I mean, just a a, a, a little uh, section, just to sort of clarify the role that we were playing on on the project. I mean, clearly we haven't got the heritage that Frank and Kyle have with the project, and and that's not really our role. Our, our role is to I guess to come in uh, and with a primary duty of care to the investor and look at that project objectively 
from a technical perspective, covering you know the consents, the permits, um, the the contracts, as Kyle mentioned, things like construction phase, health and safety program budget, and, and look at everything in the round. So with a, as, as Kyle mentioned, with a fresh pair of eyes, um, and, and sort of make sure that the, the sort of the, the project hangs together for the investor in terms of the primary duty of care, but also in terms of lending support from a, a much say a broader base of other project experience to communities. So take the enthusiasm, the expertise, the really in-depth technical knowledge that um, local communities have of their own projects and then overlay that with the, the sort of previous experience, the, the horrible lessons learned, the, the things that actually will come up and bite projects um, and, and make sure that you know we try and address those. And for schemes like NOIDAR and other um, remote projects, the areas where it's um, it becomes more complex compared to a, a maybe a more conventional sort of asset uh, on the mainland is that you can't just get one contractor to come in and wrap everything up and take all the risk and then it's a nice neat package with a bow on top and you can go away from there. Everything has more complexity, everything has more interfaces and it's managing those interfaces uh, and, and sort of drawing on the really sort of um, uh, in-depth knowledge that the team has to just say, OK, well, have we thought of this? Could we maybe tighten this up and, and sort of really get those together so that um, the, the sort of pitfalls that other projects have been through before aren't encountered again on projects um, like, like Noidart? And I think one of the observations I've seen from this is because of the level of planning and early sort of the permitting, the planning, the, the sort of environmental work that was done in such a sensitive site, that laid a really good foundation for then developing everything to the contracting stage, to the procurement stage, because all the work had to be done up front to make sure that fundamentally you could get permission for the new pipeline. Um, and it's, you know, that's been a really sort of, um, you know, maybe different to other projects where the developers uh, and, and sort of communities haven't necessarily got that sort of historical knowledge. And because this is a refurbishment project, you're starting from a position of knowing about the scheme. And so maybe for people who are doing this for the first time, it's making sure that they've got that sort of, you know, deep level of understanding and, and maybe speaking to guys like Kyle and Frank to say, OK, have you thought about this at the, at the outset uh, and, and, you know, moving that way? Um, I think the other observation I'd just like to make at the start is that always double the amount of time that you think you're going to spend on your land due diligence because property in whatever way, shape or form always takes longer to sort out. So yeah, that's that. Th those are my observations. But it's been you know a pleasure to work with the project, and uh, you know I think we've had some sort of interesting learnings from it as well in terms of how remote islands you know the challenges are there. Um, I think you've also had COVID overlaid through all of this as well. So not only was this just done at a mm -hmm. you know a, a, we need to get it done, but you need to get it done with differing working practices, um, and so that's been a real sort of. Uh, challenge that I think uh, a lot of remote communities have, have struggled with in terms of letting people come back in to their communities to work. Uh, I know when we've been working on Lewis and other places like that, we we almost went out of our way to go and speak to the, the local authorities, the local communities before mobilising because we didn't want that sort of, oh, we've got you know people bringing in, uh, in, in diseases. It sounds like Victorian times again, but you know, it's, it's that sort of uh, level of awareness that people will need. Uh, very good points, Ralph, and uh, and trying to keep the lights on at the same time. Uh, so, so Indeed. some real challenges. Frank, is there is there anything you want to kind of add before I just open up for kind of a wider discussion? I'd only endorse the fact that uh, the. I mean, if you ask me what I I've learned, um, I've learned to uh, embark upon the planning process uh, rather earlier. Um, because I needed to apply some pretty hefty pressure uh, to get it done to a necessary time scale without the uh, prices that the contractors were quoting going up uh, and without us suddenly arriving to the point where we couldn't complete the project this year uh, because we wouldn't be able to start to the next year, but the funding had already been agreed to this year uh, and uh, the pipeline might not let, last long enough for us to do that. Um, but that's not something that planning when they were going through their various processes took, I wouldn't say seriously exactly, but it wasn't top of their agenda till I made it top of their agenda. And sometimes you have to be quite assertive uh, over that. The land ownership issue was, uh, was uh, sort of highlighted by Ralph. 
again sort this out much much earlier we did have the problem of um, having to get started negotiation with one land who then proceeded to sell the estates to another landowner. And we had to start the whole process of getting anything with that, but it was just taking so long. I mean, we got to a point where I had to start contracts when the um, and I had a white knuckle weekend knowing I We're losing you a little bit, Frank. Well, I am. I think there are others. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think, so, I think the landowner got his revenge in on Frank again. No, I think what Frank was kind of just summarizing there in terms of we did have a bit of a panic moment trying to get the 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 the, 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 the Sir Richard finalized with the adjoining landowner mm -hmm. um, at the tail end of last year, the beginning of this year, and it really was came down to contractors saying, "Look, I need to have my contract signed by the beginning of March to allow me to have the full summer to to progress with the project." Yeah, I just wanted to finish um, that point about the Highland Council. Yeah. Can you hear me? You know, I can't yeah, we really can now. Go, go ahead, Frank. Yeah. Um, we had the chief exec and a senior team of Highland Council over last week, and I took her out to the hydro, and I said, "Thank goodness you've done it, because if it wasn't for you, um, I'd be the person who would have to be solving this problem, because the Scottish government would rung me up, and it would take months out of my life." And the key bit is, how do you get? To the people that can bring about change and i couldn't do it in the highway i could now uh, but then i couldn't and i think it's building up those connections so that the people at the top uh, can then make it a priority for the people further down the food chain but do you pick up on that uh, what i was saying yes um about highland council yeah most of it and i suppose that i'm going to open it up just for a wider discussion in a set but one of the things i would say is um one of the themes that's come up quite a bit today is the determination of communities to kind of deliver these projects and i think you know frank frank kind of demonstrates that that you know you do need to be determined to deliver these projects and to try and make them happen but you know our role within local energy scotland and cares is to try and make it easier and and you know the due diligence process is about making your project stronger so you know hopefully it's been useful for people to hear those um those different opinions but i would like to just let other people just uh, chip in and ask questions as well so as i said before i'll stop recording now and hopefully 